Welcome back, everyone. This video is going to wrap up the bonus videos for Space Fighter, and with that, Space Fighter will be complete for the XNA Volume 3 product. Now, what are we going to do in this video? Well, we're going to be creating a projectile missile class. The projectile missile class will enable us to give a new type of projectile to our ship, basically filling in the ship's fire action to call upon this guy, such that we have missiles that have homing capabilities. We can fire them out, and these missiles will alter their course to more or less target a particular enemy. Now, after we get this class created and functioning just fine, we're going to move into a power-up missiles class so that we can have Space Fighter start out without a player having these homing missiles, but pick up a power-up that will give these particular projectiles to the player ship. So that's what we're doing. Logan, if you want to give us a little bit more detail. The whole idea with the missiles was to give a more advanced style of projectile, because if you remember back from the original projectile and the bullet class, very little was done after projectile. Of course, projectile gave the idea of damage and the way that the projectile should work when they collide with something. But after that, bullets didn't ha really have any additional code except for the fire action itself, which was used for spawning the bullets. That's right. Here in missiles, we're going to cover some things that allow the missiles to actually have continuous, you could say, functions that occur as they exist, tick by tick. And that's really cool because what we're doing is we're leveraging the system that we've set up, the infrastructure for projectiles, just demonstrating how you can go about extending projectiles into all sorts of interesting types of projectiles. Exactly. So we'll be addressing a projectile that has its own style of behavior. Well, to get started, before we start working on any of the classes, I'm going to address some configuration because these missiles are going to need a series of properties to describe them, beginning visually and some of the standard things with projectiles, such as damage. But we'll also have some things to cover exactly how the seeking is performed. We're going to jump over to the configuration class and scroll down to the bottom where we can set up our sprite sheet field. Now, before I set that sprite sheet field, I do want to point something out in our content. The asset name for the missile is actually very slightly misspelled. Missile. I mean. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just one of those mundane details. So we'll correct that before we continue from here. I was Sounds just good. pointing that out because if you have downloaded the graphics for Space Fighter from the content server, that graphic would have been uh, misnamed. Okay. If um, if you're working on a, an updated version, then you can just go along with it. Just, just pointing that out if anyone has followed up until this point. Okay. Now, let's begin with the sprite sheet, and let's see. Today, I just feel like typing all of these out. Sure. So, let's begin with the field public static type is sprite sheet. This sprite sheet is going to be called simply missile sprite sheet. Got the I again. Yep. <laughs> And missile sprite sheet is going to be a new instance of sprite sheet. The asset name is simply going to be missile. The animation parameters will all be one because in this case the sprite sheet itself is not animated. So one in X, one in Y, and a frame rate of one. We will be specifying a sprite sheet mode so that we can specify that this is a no damage texture style of sprite. All right, moving on from here, we need to set up our damage, our speed, and the amount that a homing missile can turn. So we'll begin with damage. That is going to be a public static integer field. It is called missile damage. And we'll set this to a value of 2. The reason we're setting this so low is so that we can test the overall motion of a lot of missiles. Since there aren't many enemies on screen in the test configuration of our levels here. If the enemies are destroyed as easily as with bullets, if you add the homing ability into that, then a field of missiles will wipe out everything on screen and we won't have a lot to test with. All right, I am at this point going to speed things up a little bit with copy-paste to grab the final two fields. I'll begin by changing their types over to float. And these two remaining fields are going to be missile speed and missile turn increment. Missile speed is used in the same manner as bullet speed was earlier, simply the speed of this projectile. And the last configuration value is going to be missile turn increment. This will be a value of 0 0.07. Now, quick explanation on this missile turn increment and that is we would like to have a value that controls how fast or 
uh, trying to come up with a good way of describing this, how quickly the missiles can turn. Right. Meaning if you fire a missile and it needs to make a, a turn to reach an enemy, we're going to have a configurable value that says how quickly, basically how tight the turns can be for that missile. We can set this value very high, and the missiles will be able to turn instantly, and the only curvature to their path will be based on how fast our target was moving. Or we could set this to a very low value, and that would cause the missile to make very wide, sweeping arcs when it attempts to reach a target. And you can achieve some very interesting visual results if you tweak these values so that the missiles will have a tendency of orbiting things before they slam into a, a final enemy. Okay, cool. But again, this is simply a value to allow us to configure that. Now, with these configuration values out of the way, let's turn our attention to the actual projectile, the projectile for the missile. We'll go down to our game folder, and we'll add in a new item, and this item or class will be called projectile missile. And we'll begin with the standard namespace cleanup. We'll also go into the using statements and set up our using so that we can gain access to the xna.framework type. Microsoft.xna.framework. Just a forewarning, at the end of this, once we get into some of the final section for the missile itself, we will need to also add a using into uh, for graphics to gain access to all the graphics types. But I want to show exactly where that is, so that way it, it's not something we forget about and then just have automatically existing. I'll actually gain that when we do a specific override of a certain method. Now, on the class itself, this is indeed a projectile, so it's going to need to extend the projectile class. Now that it extends a projectile class, it is, in essence, a game node. So if we attempt to build at this point, the compiler should alert us to the fact that we're missing an overload, we're missing a default constructor. To gain a default constructor, I'm going to load up one of the more recent classes that we built. As a matter of fact, just go to projectile. Or even bullet. Oh, that'll work, yeah. Because we, we had to do the exact That's same true. thing in bullet. We had to have the bullet. We actually weren't doing anything in the constructor for the bullet, so we simply had the empty constructor. I'm going to load that up just as an easy way to grab just such an empty constructor, though, of course, the name needs to be changed to match projectile missile. But now that we've got the constructor out of the way, let's address the fields for the missile class. Inside a missile, there's actually only going to be one field, and that is a target, because these are homing missiles. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what exactly are these missiles going to home in on? Well, we'll leave that fairly general. We'll say that any missile can home in on one specific game node at any given time. We'll maintain that as a field, so that way once we begin seeking towards a certain game node, we'll continue to seek to that as long as possible. If we re-randomize what node we were seeking to every game tick, we'd have very sporadic movement where the... Uh, the missiles would continually change direction. You get, you get a much more smooth motion if you home in on only one target until either that target is destroyed or goes off screen or the missile slams into something else. So, once again, this field will be held as type game node and we'll call it target. All right, moving on from here, there's a handful of methods we'll need to override and a few we'll need to create. I'm going to skeleton all of these in just to give a good overview and also avoid any dependency issues when we go to implement all of them. The first two things I'd like to drop in are overrides to the update method and to the remove off screen methods. So putting in our override here first again is update and second is going to be remove off screen. The reason we're going to be addressing remove off screen here in missiles is Every other game node is very quickly cold, very quickly removed the moment it goes off screen. Once we have the homing motion in place, we're going to actually expand the area that missiles are allowed to go off screen. So we can actually have a case where a missile will track completely off screen and be able to make a full turn around and come back on screen. It uh, simply allows, well, for one, it allows you to have more missiles on screen at once, and it looks, uh, it just looks has a rather <laughs> interesting look to it. All right, two other methods we need. One is acquire target so that we can populate the target field, and the other is a method to be used in conjunction with the fire action delegate when spawning missiles. As far as acquiring targets go, we'll simply make a simple private method inside a missile itself. This will be called acquire target. And before we get carried away, let's grab some spelling. 
and we'll also have a method called fire missile, and we'll need to make sure that that method's signature matches the fire action delegate. So this will be public static void fire missile. We'll be taking in a vector2 for direction and a vector2 for position. And once again, just as reference on this, if we look back at the bullet, you can see we're doing the exact same here, thing here, taking in a vector and a position. All right, now that we've got the skeleton in place, we can go back up to, actually, we'll stay here down at the bottom in fire missile, and we'll implement this method first. And after this, we can actually test the projectile, though it will not yet have any modified functionality. Inside of fire missile, we're actually going to keep things relatively generic, that is, we'll make a projectile variable that's simply of type projectile. Since missile has no specific data elements that need to be configured, we'll just run all of this for a simple projectile. So in this case, we'll make a projectile local variable. I'll call this P and set this to a new instance of projectile missile. And then this is, of course, where we need to feed in a sprite sheet for the missile. And for that, we'll look back to our configuration value of missile sprite sheet. Moving on from here, we need to set up the position, direction, speed, damage, and then finally the collision list and explosion sprite sheet for this projectile. So we'll begin with our position and we'll set that equal to the incoming position parameter. We'll set our direction equal to the incoming direction parameter. We'll set our speed equal to the configuration value of missile speed. We'll set our damage equal to the configuration value missile damage. And we'll set the collision list, much like we did with bullet, we need to say that these missiles are going to be colliding with anything in the enemy's list. So the collision list is going to be set to point to enemy dot enemies. And the final thing we can set up is to have the explosion effect with the explosion sprite sheet. And we'll set that to the same as bullets. So p dot explosion sprite sheet will be equal to the configuration value of projectile explosion. All right. With those values out of the way, we should be able to build. And that takes care of our error that was originally pointing at the missing constructor. And at this point, if we would like, we could test to just to make sure that this class is, in fact, usable as a projectile. To do that, we could go over to the player ship, and we could simply change our fire action from bullets over to missiles. So if we change projectile bullet to projectile missile, we can gain access to the fire missile method to be used in conjunction with a new fire action delegate that we set for the player ship. So if we run now, we can see that we have indeed changed at least the sprite of this new projectile. But before we go on and work on the missile anymore, I'm actually going to change the ship's weapon configuration just a little bit. Since we have this wide burst wave pattern and we have sidearms, it can get confusing as to exactly what we're looking at. So just for the creation of missile, I'm going to comment out the creation of the sidearms. I'm going to comment out the creation of the burst weapon that's used with the burst weapon excuse me, burst auto weapon, and we'll make a new weapon. We'll set the ship's weapon to a simple automatic weapon. So new weapon auto. And the setup here is just the required ship and the fire interval. For fire interval, I'm going to grab something relatively slow. I'm actually going to look at the overall repeat rate for the entire wave, which was the value in uh, configuration. That was wave fire interval times wave fire total. That's giving us the overall repeat rate. But if used for a single projectile, that gives us more time to see what the individual projectiles are doing. So we can see here a much more simplistic fire method and significantly slower. But now this will allow us to focus on individual missiles when we start creating the seeking behavior. All right. 
Now we can turn our attention back to the projectile missile class. And before we address the seeking itself, we need to have some way for the projectile, for the missile, to be able to gain a target. And for that, we're going to implement the acquire target method. This method is going to check and make sure that the projectile does have a collision list set. And if it does, it's going to pick a random node out of that collision list and use that node for the target. So we'll begin with an if statement that checks the collision list to make sure it's not null. And therefore, to make sure that we do, in fact, have a collision list, just in case there would be some scenario where we would use this class and forget to set the collision list. That way, we wouldn't cause access to a list that doesn't exist. But if we do have a collision list, we'll set our target field equal to a random node from that list. To gain access to a random node, we'll use the pick random node that's back in the game node class. So game node dot pick random node. Then we can specify our collision list as the list we would like to pick a node from. With this method out of the way, that gives us a very easy way to pick targets and we can use that inside of update in any case where we don't already have a target. So up here in update, before we use the target to gain locations and directions, let's for, first make sure that we have a target. If we don't have a target, we'll run acquire target and hopefully gain one. So we'll run an if statement to say if the current target is equal to null or the current target is dead because of course there's a case, there could be a complex scenario going on where multiple things have or maybe a game node has just exploded but has not yet been removed from the list by the remove dead call we want to make sure that we don't ever try to seek to a dead node otherwise we'll get some sporadic behavior with the missiles but if that is indeed the case if we haven't set the target at all or if the target we were looking at has died let's acquire a new target so we'll run this dot acquire target and that should attempt to gain a new target. Of course, there's, there's the possibility of not gaining a new target. If we, for some reason, didn't have a collision list, we'd still come back with no target. Or if the collision list was empty, let's say at this moment in gameplay there were no enemies in existence, we'd come up with a case where we still wouldn't have a target. So even after we run acquire target, that's not guaranteed to have actually found a target. So before we try to seek to anything, we're going to make sure that the target we got back is indeed an actual target. So we'll do a check that says if this.target is not equal to null and this.target is not dead. So let me invert that with the not operator. So again, basically just the opposite of what we checked when we tried to get a target. So basically if we didn't have one or it was dead, we need one. But if it's not null and it's not dead, then we know we have an actual live target that can be used for seeking. So in this case, now we need to come up with the math that will give us a seeking style behavior. To simplify the idea of seeking, the way we're going to approach this is to set up a scenario where the missile tries to change its rotation to point towards the target, but does so in increments smaller than necessary, meaning it will take multiple game ticks for the missile to actually orient itself and point towards the target. Now we'll be doing this as a series of steps. So the very first thing we'll do is show just how we convert the position of ourselves and the position of the target into a vector that can be pointed along. So to show that in the very simple sense, we could just directly set our direction as a missile equal to our target's position minus our position. That will give a vector pointing basically from us to that target. Now we're going to take and normalize that vector, because if we actually use that for direction, A, we wouldn't be using a unit vector in direction anymore, and B, we would be using a value so large that we would snap directly to it, or if more than one game tech was allowed to elapse, completely past it, and then off screen and get removed. So the direction is actually going to be equal to the result of a call to vector2.normalize, and then we'll put the vector subtraction inside of here. So once we subtract one vector to another, we'll normalize that to a unit vector. So we essentially have a vector that points in the direction we would need to go to the target, but without actually giving enough magnitude to jump there in one game tick. So the actual math in this is going to be target.position minus this.position. So if we get that value, and then normalize it, we should have a scenario where each time this line is run, we change our orientation 
or basically change our direction to be pointing directly at that target. So if everything else is still in, still running, let me do a quick build to make sure that there's no errors. Let's see what we're getting as far as behavior right now. If we run and we begin firing missiles, we can see that they are indeed seeking towards enemies. As a matter of fact, if I leave the full automatic on, we can see that they're picking random enemies. And also that as each projectile picks an, a target, it stays locked to that target until that target is no longer usable. So we have nice smooth motion. Though it is very quick, you can see that the projectiles have, uh, well, they have perfect accuracy, which could be good for making the game easier. But the visual result is more interesting if you give some amount of time that has to pass for the projectile to be able to orient itself. So to give an idea of this, what we need to do is we need to be able to turn less than this amount per game tick, because setting our direction using this formula directly sets our orientation. There's no time for, it, it takes no time to, to change. So what we're going to do is instead of directly using it, we're gonna make a variable. We'll make a vector two called target direction. And we'll save that so that later we can use part of that. That way we can take our current direction and we can increment it towards the target direction, but not necessarily all the way. So what we're going to do with our own direction in this case is we're going to increment it from whatever its current value is towards the target direction. Once we do this, there's no guarantee that that will result in a unit vector, so we'll be sure to turn around and normalize direction once we're done with any operation that might take place. And if we do this, if we leave this as is, simply increment directly to target direction, we'll see no uh, real change yet, but that's because we haven't reduced the um, influence of target direction per tick. We're still incrementing all the way to the target's direction in one game tick. But now that we've got this in place, we've actually got a scenario that's broken down in detail enough that we can adjust how much we change direction each game tick. If we were to multiply this by a value less than one, then we would have some fraction of the overall target direction. And we have just such a value in the configuration as missile turn increment. This is where we can calculate exactly how much do we turn turn towards any given target. And if you remember, this value is currently set to 0.07. So with a much lower turn increment, we get this behavior, where the missiles follow a smooth curve on their way towards their desired target. Very nice. So now we run into a scenario where a missile, if it isn't aimed properly, will curve and try to turn back around towards its target, but may not necessarily make it, as it could easily crash into another enemy or fall off screen. But notice something that's happening as the missiles fall off screen. If a missile goes just off screen enough that it's invisible, it gets removed because that's the nature, the default nature of any game node when you call remove off screen. In the case of missiles, it would be nice to expand that area so missiles have to go farther off screen before they're removed because then you get more of the arcing style motions if the missiles are allowed to go off screen and then come back on screen. In order to accomplish this, we're going to use our overridden remove off screen method. As a matter of fact, we're going to re-implement this in a manner almost identical to its original, but we'll do this in a way that will give us a uh, different overall view bounds. As a matter of fact, since the code is very similar, I'm actually going to go over to the game node, and inside of game node, scroll down to the bottom where we're creating our remove off screen method, and I'll copy the first two lines Actually, I'll copy all three lines because we do need to make a call to remove out of bounds. We can't make a call to base dot remove off screen because that's going to go back to the old way it worked. And if we paste these lines of code in place and remove the call to base dot remove off screen, we now have what we need to adjust this so that we can use a different set of bounds. Now, the original bounds is still useful to us. This was a rectangle that was created to match the playable area. Originally, it was created to match the overall screen size, but you remember we later constrained the screen size to a view region. So that's where uh, screen width got replaced with view width. But if we were to run very briefly and get an idea of exactly what we're looking at, let me set a breakpoint just after bounds is acquired run the game and fire a missile, we'll trigger the breakpoint. And if we look at bounds, we can see it has a value of X and Y and zero, zero, a width of 450 and a height of 600, which matches our exact view region. 
after we inflate it, actually let me walk, let me step one line ahead. After we inflate it, we have a little bit off screen and a little bit wider. And it's only a little bit because these are these missiles are relatively small. As a matter of fact, they're 16 by 16 graphics. So half of that would be 8 and 8. And that's where we get the very slightly expanded boundary that allows us to go just to the visible edge of the sprite. But as we said, in the case of missiles, we want a much larger area so that sprites can make, or excuse me, missiles can make a turn and go back on screen. In order to do that, we'll extend the overall bounds roughly 50% each direction, so almost doubling the amount of screen area that they're able to cover. To do this, what we'll do is instead of expanding by the sprite's origin, we'll expand by half of the view width and half of the screen height. So that way add 50% to the top and bottom, add 50% to the left and right. So what I'll do is I'll copy config.view width. We'll put that in place for the X parameter of the inflate column, but we'll divide that by two. And then we'll take our screen height, copy that value, and put it in place, divided by two, for the inflate calls y value. I'm going to set a breakpoint just after the bounds dot inflate, so we can see what kind of size we're getting after the inflation takes place. So if we run again, hit fire, so we trip the breakpoint, we can see that bounds is now equal to a value of negative 225, negative 300, and x and y, which makes sense because that's half of the view width, which is 450, and half of the screen height, which is 600. Also, the width and the height are double the view width and the screen height. So now we've got a much larger area that the projectiles can roam in before they're removed. The gameplay result of that is that if we watch many missiles that go off screen, you can see them actually trace back on screen. So some of the ones that were over up in the higher area would almost come back on screen at the bottom. But again, once you have a lot of missiles, this can create some very visually interesting results. But now that we have our missile seeking code in place, we have one last thing to address, and that is a purely visual element. If you notice now, all of the missiles are maintaining uh, their current rotation. As a matter of fact, everything in Space Fighter thus far has had, well, really no rotation support. Everything is just drawn as it is oriented by default. In the case of missiles, though, that really does make them look odd, as one would expect a missile to physically turn in the direction that it is traveling. Now, in Space Fighter, we haven't addressed rotation for the majority of the sprites, things like the player ships and enemies, because we would need to also take into account the collision that would be required, the rotational collision in those cases. But with missiles, since they're small enough, I decided that it would be worthwhile to make them uh, able to rotate without adjusting their collision. So what we're going to do is we're going to add the ability to draw, on it, to draw a sprite rotated, but we're not going to worry about the collision itself. Because once again, with the, the missiles, they're so fast and so small that you really couldn't tell one way or the other. But just pointing that out, that this, this uh, enhancement that we're going to do isn't a magic bullet that allows everything in Space Fire to collide in a rotated manner. Now what we do need to do is we need to add a little bit of extra support to the sprite class, because at the moment we don't have the ability to draw things in a rotated fashion. So we'll load up the sprite class, and we'll go all the way down to draw. We'll adjust the signature of draw, and we'll add in a new parameter. We'll add in a floating value called rotation. Then inside of the call to sprite batch draw, we'll scroll over to the rotation parameter, which if I bring up the uh, parameter completion, we can see that this value is indeed the rotation. So if we replace it with the rotation parameter, we should be able to pass that through to the actual sprite batch draw call. Now, this has changed a method that's very coarse. As a matter of fact, we had to go back to the engine section to change this. So how many methods has this broken? If we build, we see that it has only broken one method. The only thing that is making calls to the sprite draw at this moment is the node class itself. So we can jump over to the error and we can see that inside of node, it's the node's draw method that in turn calls the sprite's draw method. So we could very quickly fix this and retain the original behavior of Space Fighter by simply having the node by default call rotation, or excuse me, give a rotation value of zero. If we do that, that fixes up our only error, and Space Fighter still functions as it originally had, so nothing has been broken. But giving ourselves this rotation parameter allows us to, inside of the missile class, specify a rotation as the missiles travel.
and we'll specify this rotation as we're drawn. So basically, as missiles, we'll override the draw method itself. We'll calculate a good rotational value for ourselves based on our direction and feed that along to the sprite's draw method. So right here, after remove off screen, let's jump down and override the draw method. Now you note that as I drop this in, we get the fully qualified namespace to the uh, graphics. Uh, uh, to, excuse me, to the graphics of namespace. This is what I was saying earlier when we would have to add one final using statement. I mean, we don't necessarily have to. A fully qualified namespace would work just fine here. But I would rather place this up at the top as we have done in other classes inside of Space Fighter. Now back to the draw method, we're going to wipe off the call to base.draw because we need to make the call to sprites draw method ourselves here because of course the base is just going to pass along zero. Now before we make any call to a draw method, we need to figure out what our rotation would be. What is the angle that would go along with our current direction or rather how do we convert our direction vector into an angle in radians? Well, we'll do this using the ATAN2 method as we have in past uh, scenarios. So let's make a local variable of type float called angle. And then we'll populate this using ATAN2. ATAN2 is going to need the y and x components. We'll grab these from our direction vector. So this dot direction dot y and this dot direction dot x. Now, A10 2, of course, returns a double, and we're trying to store this in a float, so we'll cast this over to float before storing it. Also, we will probably have to adjust the, the specific rotation itself, but I want to test it on screen so we know exactly what we're working with. Now that we do have an angle, though, we can pass that along to draw. And more specifically, we'll pass that along to the sprites draw method. So this dot sprite dot draw. We need to feed in a sprite batch, which is already given to us in our own draw column. We need to feed in a position, which we'll use from our own position. And the rotation we'll give as the new angle variable. Now with all this in place, let's test and see what the missiles look like. If we fire missiles, you can see that they do rotate as they travel, but they're oriented incorrectly. They're not pointing straight ahead, they're pointing to the left. As a matter of fact, I'm going to kind of use a cheating method of pausing the game. I'm just going to click on it and hold for a second, and we can see that the missiles are pointing to the left. So if I shoot a missile and then pause the game very briefly, you can see that they're pointing directly over to the left. That means we need to rotate them clockwise 90 degrees. So that means here we need to offset the angle by some number of radians. We'll offset that, and we need to offset it by a fraction of pi, because of course if we add pi to it, pi being 180 degrees, if we added pi, we should be pointing all the way over to the right. As a matter of fact, we could prove that by grabbing a constant for pi inside of math helper, just adding pi to the value. Now if we fire missiles, they do in fact point over to the right. So we need to divide this value of pi by 2. When the math helper actually has a given constant for math, or for, excuse me, for pi divided by 2, if we bring up word completion, we can see that we also have the pi over 2 constant. If we put this into place and pause the game, we can see that the missiles are now oriented directly ahead, but they still maintain their rotation, so we see missiles that rotate based on the direction that they're traveling. So this gives a much more convincing effect for seeking missiles. Very nice. Now, just to show what we can do with the turn increment value, let's go back to our configuration and just mess around with some different values. As a matter of fact, let's first set this all the way back to 1. And we can see that this gives the original behavior where missiles seek directly towards something. So they will curve very slightly, but that's only because their targets are moving. Otherwise, they seek instantly towards things. We could also put in a value of less than the original, maybe 0 0.001, so one-seventh of the seeking ability they originally had. And now the missiles only very lightly even attempt <laughs> to seek. They turn slightly, but very little is done as far as actual right. seeking. But again, this gives a good value to go in and play around with to get the adequate amount of turn that you want for how you'd like the missiles to work, meaning we could up this to a little bit above what we had originally, 0 0.09 instead of 0 0.07, and we get a much more accurate and possibly more useful, depending on the speed of the game, uh, turn value. But we still have the possibility that a missile could completely orbit an enemy and have to go creening off in another direction.
But again, there's a lot of room to tweak with that to get an exact value that you're looking for. Excellent. I was going with a value of 0 0.07 because, as we'll see in just a second, I liked the visual result that that came up with. And to show one other thing that's cool, and then really this is just going back to the weapon system in general, at this point we could go back to the player ship class and we could put some of our original firing back in. That is, we'll take out this temporary weapon and we'll put in our original burst fire wave weapon and see that it works just fine with missiles. <laughs> so now we can have a large number of missiles all on screen at once and watch their seeking behavior as they fly off screen and then seek any relevant enemy. So this is where you get a lot of nice patterns from, by having a lot of missiles. And you can even see a little bit of the original fire pattern after the missiles have fully circled something. Mm -hmm. Now you can see that the pattern gets a lot narrower because a lot of the missiles are all trying to seek in towards the same target, so they'll at some point converge all on top of each other. But at the given uh, turn increment, it takes a while for them to actually converge, so you still have a relatively nice stream or pattern of missiles that circle around enemies. But... Now that we have our missiles working, as a matter of fact, I believe this actually wraps the projectile missile class itself. We have all the behavior that we need in place, and that is something that looks different, is fired by a custom firing method, has the ability to acquire targets, and has the ability to seek those targets by use of a modified update call. Now that we've got these missiles, this gives the opportunity to show more of a weapon-style power-up. Let's go ahead and make a power-up that gives the player ship the missile's projectile type upon pickup. So to do this, we'll once again go over to the game folder, add in a new item, and this class will be called Power-Up Missiles. And we'll, of course, begin with the standard cleanup. The Power-Up Missiles class needs to extend the Power-Up class. Because it's in extending power up, we now need an empty constructor, as we're not going to do anything additional inside of the constructor. So I'll steal the constructor that was made in projectile missile, again, simply because it needed to do the exact same thing with an empty constructor. We'll change the name of the constructor to public power up missiles instead of projectile missile. And now we can move on to the part that we're most interested in, and that is an override to apply pickup so that when the power-up missiles pickup is contacted by the player ship, we can cause that ship to acquire missiles instead of the default bullets. So we'll do this with an override to the apply power-up. Excuse me, I was, saying, I was describing this as apply pickup when it is indeed apply power-up. But all the same, once we hit the pickup, we have our ship. We're going to remove our call to the base apply power-up because, of course, it's empty. And instead, we're going to take the ship that was collided with in the pickup, and we're going to change its fire action. We'll change the fire action equal to a new fire action, and this new fire action delegate is going to point to projectile missile dot fire missile. Now, before we can easily use this, I'm going to go into our level class and set it up so that it can use power missiles because, believe it or not, that's all we need to do for the, for the power-up itself. Really, it all comes down to one single line. The only other things we have are the constructor and the necessary code for the method itself. Now, we're going to go into level, and we're going to give support for missile power-ups. So we'll begin in the level class at the very top with the item type enumeration. We're going to add a new element, and that is uh, power-up missiles that this is a recognized item type, and we'll correct some brief spelling in power up missiles. And then down inside of build level, let's change that power up health we were using for tests earlier to a power up missiles power up. That way we get a power up very quickly within the playback of the level. As a matter of fact, that will be the second level item that is added to the game. A little bit lower, I'm also going to change the, ra the range of the random value for choosing random projectiles, or excuse me, random power-ups. That way the missile's power-up will get included. And finally, we can add support inside of spawn item so that power-up missiles will be a recognized type that, re that results in a new instance of power-up, or excuse me, projectile missile. So the item type that we're looking for is 
power-up missiles. If we have indeed found a power-up missile, we'll spawn a new instance of power-up missiles. And the sprite sheet that we need to give to that is one that we have not yet declared in the configuration. We need to have a sprite sheet that points towards it because, of course, we have the graphical asset here called power-up missiles. So before we can drop this in place, we need to have the value available inside of the configuration. And that is going to be a sprite sheet for the power-up itself. I'm going to copy the sprite sheet that's currently in use for the missiles. And we'll change the name of this field to missile power-up sheet. Then the asset name itself needs to be changed to missiles, or excuse me, power-up missiles. That way, back inside of the level class, when we go to create a new power-up for missiles, we have the missile power-up sheet that can be used for the sprite sheet. And at this point, we should have full support for missile power-ups inside of our level. Now, before we test this, we need to have our ship already start or start out with something other than missiles so we can see whether or not the fire action changes over. So back inside of player ship, we'll change the fire action back to projectile bullet dot fire bullet. That way when we begin the game, we're firing the standard style plasma bullet, but as we collide with a missile's power-up, we begin firing missiles. So really the power-up system is very easily able to handle changes in fire action. Very nice. As a matter of fact, if we restart the game and grab separate controllers, if I join in the second player, I should be able to grab the missile's power-up, and now I have gained missiles while the original player has not yet. If we give just a minute for one to spawn on screen, now both ships have the missile's power-up. Excellent. So this is also working perfectly for multiple player scenarios. And really with that, I believe that's going to bring this lesson to a close. We have created missiles that have a homing style behavior. We've created a power-up that allows a ship to gain missiles. And we've added support into the level system so that missile power-ups can be spawned. And with that, that's pretty much going to wrap Space Fighter up as well. So we have created a very robust engine that one could take advantage of and really extend into quite a nice top-down 2D shooter. So with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot, everyone.